is the Mahapadata Podcast, Episode 12, Krishna at Play. Whenever Dharma declines in the world and sinfulness dominates, the Lord Hari incarnates on the earth. Last episode, I introduced a new book, the Bhagavata Purana, which is the ancient source for many details of Krishna's life, plus his many prior avatars. We then covered King Yati's love life and eventual renunciation, and how his youngest son inherited the imperial title and became the ancestor to our main heroes, the Pandavas. Yayati's eldest son was named Yadu, whose descendant was Krishna. Following the descendants of Yadu through the generations, we finally reach the period of the Mahabharata with a king named Ugrasena, Lord of Mathura. Ugrasena had a nephew named Vasudeva, who was engaged to marry King Ugrasena's daughter named Devaki. The heir to the throne was Devaki's brother, Kamsa. Following the wedding of Vasudeva with Devaki, the bride was escorted to her husband's home by her brother Kamsa. As the wedding party was traveling, an unearthly voice suddenly spoke. It addressed Kamsa, saying, Fool, the eighth son of the woman you are escorting will one day kill you. Kamsa immediately acted on this message. Jumping down from his chariot, he grabbed his sister by the hair and drew his sword. Vasudeva moved to save her, asking Kamsa how could he do such a thing to his own sister on her wedding day. He persuaded Kamsa to relent by telling him that Devaki would not be his killer, only her sons. He promised Kamsa that they would hand over their children as soon as they were born. Kamsa accepted Vasudeva's promise and allowed them to go home. It is important to remember that behind this drama there is a celestial conflict taking place. The demons and asuras had all incarnated on earth in various forms, and in response the gods and apsaras had done the same. Thus, Kamsa and his confederates all had a much larger conspiracy to stop Krishna and his allies. Not much later, a rishi came to Kamsa and pointed out that many of Vasudeva's allies were actually divine incarnations, and thus stricter measures should be taken to ensure that none of Vasudeva's children should ever be born. Kamsa acted on this advice by promptly having Vasudeva and Devaki shackled and thrown into a prison cell. Kamsa's father, King Ugrasena, objected to his tyrannical actions, and so Kamsa had his own father deposed and was made king in his place. King Kamsa married the two daughters of King Jarasand of Magadha, near modern-day Bihar. This was a powerful alliance. As we'll see in later episodes, Jarasand was an aspiring emperor who had already conquered many neighboring kingdoms. Following Kamsa's coup, many Yadavas fled the kingdom out of fear and dissatisfaction. Meanwhile, Vasudeva and Devaki were kept under close surveillance, and the first six of her children were all murdered just moments after their birth. Devaki's seventh child was already incredibly powerful inside her womb. This baby was the incarnation of Sesha, the cosmic snake, who would be born as Krishna's brother, Balaram. She felt a great joy, but also dread that this baby, too, might be killed. It turns out that Vasudev had another wife, named Rohini, who had taken refuge with a tribe of cowherds, called Gopis. Lord Vishnu, seen as Amsavatara in this danger, ordered the goddess Durga to transport the fetus to Rohini's womb. It was supposed that Devaki had miscarried, since her pregnancy suddenly disappeared. Thus, while Balaram was born to Rohini, Vasudeva was infused with Vishnu's power, and thus possessed, he impregnated Devaki with the avatar of God who dwells everywhere, in all beings, and in all things. Thus impregnated, Devaki shone like the moon. Kamsa noted this change about her and suspected she might be pregnant with his murderer but he was somehow hesitant to kill her or the child. Finally, in the middle of the night, Devaki gave birth to the Lord Mahavishnu. He appeared to them in his divine form, with four arms holding his conch, mace, bow, and discus. Vasudeva prostrated himself before the vision and worshipped Vishnu. Then Vishnu disappeared, and in his place was a newborn baby boy, Krishna. Almost immediately, Vasudeva was telepathically instructed by the infant to carry him away, to the Gopa settlement where Rohini and Balaram lived in Gokula. Vasudeva picked up the child and immediately his shackles fell away. The guards were all sleeping and the doors of the prison were wide open. Vasudeva carried the baby out of the prison and headed directly for Gokula. There was a raging storm that night and so the cosmic snake Adi Sesha appeared and escorted the father and child using his enormous hoods to shield them from the rain. When Vasudeva reached the Yamuna River, it was in flood, but Gokula was on the other side. As soon as he set foot on the riverbank, the waters parted, and a dry path appeared for him to cross. 
when he reached the town of the cowherds, he went to the house of their chieftain, Nanda. Vasudev approached Nanda's wife, Yashoda, who was sleeping with her newborn daughter. He placed the baby Krishna next to her and picked up the baby girl and returned with her to the prison. This girl was the incarnation of Durga. He placed her next to his wife and lay down. His shackles immediately reattached themselves and all the prison doors slammed shut. Back in Gokula, Yashoda woke up and assumed this boy was hers, forgetting completely that she had given birth to a daughter. The next morning, everything was back in order. The newborn girl began wailing and the guards passed on the word that Devaki had given birth. Kamsa jumped out of bed in a fright and went straight to the prison. Devaki was terrified and held the baby close, but Kamsa tore the child from her grasp, whirled her by the legs, and attempted to dash her brains out against the wall. At that moment, the child transformed back into the form of the goddess Durga, eight arms and all. Kamsa cowered and Durga laughed, saying, Fool, you killed the wrong child. The one who is destined to kill you has already been born. Seek him out if you can, but stop killing children. With another laugh, she vanished in a flash of light. Kamsa was briefly repentant. He threw himself at his sister's feet, begging her forgiveness for all the horrible things he had done. He ordered the couple to be unshackled and freed from prison. He allowed them to return to their home. Later in the day, Kamsa's advisors were shocked by his change of heart. They worried that the exiles might form a rebellion around Vasudeva and Devaki. They pointed out that his killer still lived and was disguised among the many children in his kingdom. They advised him to kill every newborn boy in the kingdom if that's what it took to avert his fate. Kamsa finally gave in to his advisors and surrendered himself to complete perdition, ordering the slaughter of all the baby boys. Meanwhile, the baby Krishna was raised in obscurity by the chief of the Gopas and his wife Yashoda, who thought they were his natural parents. In order to find this child, Kamsa enlisted the support of a Rakshasa named Putana. Putana disguised herself as a beautiful woman with large milk-filled breasts. Her trick was to put poison on her breast and then to suckle the babies and kill them. As she came into Krishna's village of Raja, everyone was fascinated by her beauty. She saw the child sleeping on a cot and entered through the front gate. Yashoda and Nanda were transfixed by her strange beauty while she pretended to admire the child. Putana picked up Krishna, bared her poisoned breast, and set him to suckle. The child seized the breast eagerly and began to suck energetically, holding it firmly in his grip. He not only drew out all the poison and whatever ooze there was in her breast, he fed on her very life. Putana shrieked and tried to pull the baby off of her, but he maintained his grip. She changed back into her original form, huge, clawed, and scaly, but the baby held on. She shot off into the sky, with Krishna still attached, and then came crashing to the ground, dead, crushing trees and huts where she fell. The terrified villagers all ran to view this enormous corpse, and saw Krishna laying on top of her, laughing and kicking his legs playfully. The cowherds had to cut up the enormous corpse and burn the pieces. Amazingly, instead of a horrible stench, the smoke made by Putana was sweet, like sandalwood. Even a demon having her life sucked out of her by Krishna was saved by her contact with him. She had attained moksha. There are two more stories of demons attacking the infant Krishna. They were all somehow sent by Kamsa, but Kamsa never discovered Krishna's identity. The first of these stories is of a demon that was in the shape of a cart. Krishna was placed in the shade of this cart and left there. The tiny baby kicked one of the wheels and destroyed the cart. The second story is of a demon that came in the form of a tornado. This demon drew the baby Krishna up into the air to carry him away and kill him. But Krishna made himself heavier and heavier until he dragged the demon back to earth and killed it. Both of these demons were also liberated, because even to be killed by Krishna is to be saved by him. The final picture we get of the baby Krishna is a calm afternoon with Yashoda nursing the baby contentedly. The child finished suckling with drops of milk running down his chin and he yawned. Yashoda looked into his mouth and saw the entire universe. Her mind could not bear the infinite expanse and she fainted at the sight. As toddlers, Krishna and Balaram were irrepressible and always underfoot. They liked to grab the tails of calves and let themselves be dragged through the mud. Soon they were walking and then running and Krishna became a rambunctious little brat. One day the gopis came to complain to Yashoda that he untied the calves so they drank up all the milk, he stole butter and fed it to the monkeys. When he was full he entertained himself by breaking the containers. When they scolded him, he just laughed in their faces and then relieved himself in their yards. They turned to look at the little felon to say what he had to say for himself, 
but he looked so sweet and innocent that they just broke out laughing. On one occasion, the children ran to Yashoda and told her that Krishna was eating mud. Yashoda scolded him, saying dirt was full of worms and filth. Krishna denied it. She told him, don't lie, let me see in your mouth. So Krishna opened his mouth wide, and once again, Yashoda saw the whole universe, its galaxies and stars, the earth, the mountains and seas, the villages, and even herself looking into Krishna's mouth. Yashoda just sat down on the porch stunned. She completely forgot about the question of Krishna eating mud. Here's an extended quote from the Bhagavata Purana. Vyasa's son, Sri Sukha, said, One morning, Yashoda had set her maids to clean her house, wash the clothes, and do the cooking, while she herself began churning milk to make curd. As she churned, she began singing softly. She wore a silk garment round her ample hips, fastened with a golden girdle. Her fine breasts oozed milk from the great mother's love that she felt whenever she thought or sang about her son, which was most of the time. The bracelets around her wrists and her pendulous gypsy earrings flashed in the sun as she churned vigorously. Beads of sweat stood out on her face at her exertions. Her smooth skin shone with moisture. Her hair, which hung to her knees, shed the jasmine flowers she had braided into them. Yashoda was a picture of radiant, fulfilled womanhood as she made her curd. A thirsty Krishna came up behind her. He put out his small hand and stopped her churning, as ever filling her with joy. Immediately, she took him onto her lap and gave him her welling breast. Pleasure washed over his face as he drank avidly, like the waves of a sea, and her adoring gaze never left his dark features as she stroked his curled locks. Little did she know that this was God himself she was suckling. A smile of complete contentment played on Krishna's face, when suddenly Yashoda noticed that some milk she put on the fire had boiled over. She gave a cry, and setting Krishna down on the floor, jumped up to take the milk off. He had not finished drinking. His lips puckered up, his eyes grew red, and he bit his lip in frustration. In a flash, he picked up a great stone pestle and cracked his mother's churning vessel in two, so all her curds spilled out. With tears in his eyes, he grabbed a pat of butter and went off to sulk in another room. When Yashoda had taken the milk off the hearth, she turned to find her curd all over the floor. She only laughed. She loved him so much, what else would she do? Then she went to look for him, but could not find him anywhere. She came out into her yard and saw him astride an upturned stone mortar used for husking rice. He had a great pat of butter next to him and was feeding gobs of it to the monkeys. Softly, Yashoda crept up on her son from behind, a thin stick in her hand. He saw her before she reached him and ran off in terror. She ran after him, but her hips were heavy and she could not catch him. The child fled from her, dodging behind this bush or that tree, but then he suddenly seemed to tire. His eyes streaming with tears, he stopped his flight and allowed her to catch him. She seized him roughly by the hand and threatened him with the stick. Then she saw his eyes had filled with tears and fright. She could not bring herself to beat him. Throwing away the stick, she decided to tie him up instead to the rice husking mortar. She did not know who he was. Taking the Brahman, who had assumed a human form in Leela, to be her son, Mother Yashoda tried to fasten him to the mortar with the piece of rope she found. The rope was two fingers shorter than she needed. She tied another piece to it, and it was still two fingers too short. Puzzled, she attached another longer rope. It was still two fingers too short. In a frenzy, she went into the house to get a much longer rope. Some gopis gathered around to watch what she was doing. They were surprised to see her trying to punish her son. Of course, Yashoda was in fact trying to tie a rope around the entire universe. Krishna saw her desperation, and suddenly the rope in Yashoda's hands was much longer than she needed, and she now secured him easily to the mortar, continuing to feign anger at him. The Rishi say that by allowing his mother to tie him up, Krishna symbolically showed how he always allows his devotees to subdue him. Krishna was a real brat when he was a kid, so I'm inclined to leave him tied up like that for now. In the coming episodes, I'll try to wrap up Krishna's backstory, how he enjoyed his adolescence, killed a few more demons, and then finally got his revenge against his cruel uncle Kamsa. Thanks for listening. <laughs>